Welcome to Multitech's Facts Finder Facts over IP technical training video. In this video we will cover the installation, configuration screens, and discuss some applications of the Facts over IP server. The FF240 IP's hardware contains an Atom-based processor inside. On the front side of the unit are three status LEDs that show the Ethernet link and speed and hard drive activity. There is also an LED showing that power is applied to the device. On the back side you have a 12 volt power connector, a console port for hooking up to a terminal in case the unit needs to be debugged, and an ethernet port for hooking up the device into the customer's network. Currently the USB ports are reserved for future use. The reset button is for resetting the hardware. In a future release we will have the ability for the reset button to set the unit to factory defaults. Now let's talk about the main features of this release. The FF240-IP fax over IP server is a T.38 faxing product line that only supports the SIP protocol. T.38 is a real-time faxing protocol and offers more reliable faxing. The unit defaults to two ports and can be upgraded in two port increments to eight ports. There is also a license manager that allows you to add two port licenses up to eight maximum. We'll talk about this more later. Again, it's based on a new Atom processor, which is much faster than the current FFX30 series, which is based on the Xscale processor. It includes one gigabyte of memory, two gigabytes of compact flash, and a gigabit ethernet port. The client software is virtually the same as the current client, except we added a feature to detect the FF240-IP's hardware. Currently, the FF240-IP is capable of V.34 faxing speeds. That's 33.6 kilobits a second. Dialogic is the only other faxing solution on the market to support faxing at these speeds. Interop testing is being conducted with Shortel, Avaya SES and the Avaya IP office, and Avaya Session Manager and Mitel are in the pipeline. This overview gives you a rough idea of how you can use the product. Typically what you'll have is an IP PBX or a SIP ITSP whom you'll be using the fax over IP server. The fax over IP server would be connected to the IPPBX or SIP ITSP using a SIP trunk and in turn the IPPBX would be connected to the PSTN network that would talk with your remote fax machines. The PC clients on your local area network and are used for sending and receiving faxes. A typical customer would set up a SIP trunk between the IPPBX and FF240-IP and set up routing rules in the IPPBX or ITSP so that any incoming faxes from the PSTN are routed to the SIP trunks connected to the fax over IP server. Likewise, on the fax over IP server, you would want to make sure you configure routes for dialing out whenever faxes are queued at the server. You may also want to configure on the fax over IP server individual accounts for different users on your local network for enabling routing of incoming fax calls. The incoming SIP fax calls are essentially routed using the extension information, which is part of the SIP headers. The SIP headers come in two forms. The two header is used in 90% of the cases. However, there are some other SIP based faxes servers built into the PBXs which provide you the extension information of their diversion header. Again, this is something configurable in our fax over IP product, which you should be aware of. In this next screen, we'll go over some of the main configurations that need to be done on the fax over IP server for configuring it for T.38 and SIP protocols. For people that are familiar with our analog fax finder, the big difference between that product line and the FF240-IP is this screen. On our analog fax finders, we had an analog modem configuration that allowed you to configure each one of the modems and set up different options. Since this is purely a SIP based product line, we do not have that option and you'll need to configure your SIP server and T38. Some of the key parameters that you would want to focus on are the SIP proxy and gateway, which is essentially the IP address or domain name of your local SIP proxy, which is probably residing in your IP PBX, a gateway hooked up to your PSTN network or ITSP providers IP address or domain name. Some other products that may require a SIP domain which is used for authentication, which can be filled in the SIP domain field. The local and SIP proxy ports are typically set at 5060, which are the defaults from a SIP standard. 
However, most of this information should be available from your IPPBX, gateway configuration, or from your ITSP. Keep in mind that you need to match up these parameters so the fax over IP server points to a SIP service or IPPBX in which you are trying to interface it with. An important note is the current fax over IP product line only supports the UDP protocol and hence it is a static field. You'll need to make sure that you enable the UDP protocol on your IPPBX, gateway, or ITSP network. The authorization required checkbox can be enabled if you need to authorize your SIP calls with the IPPBX or SIP service provider. Once again, this information is something you would want to get when you sign up for a SIP account or when you set up the account on your PBX. Likewise, the registrar options is for when you want to register the fax over IP device as an extension or as an endpoint with the PBX or the service provider, so you can use these fields. Moving on to T.38, these fields cover how you want to do your T.38 negotiations and what are your T.38 capabilities. More information on all these fields are available in the Administrator's Guide for the FF240-IP. Now we move on to the server's fax status page. This is essentially a similar page on our analog fax finder device. It shows the status of all the channels that are currently available. If the channels are configured for inbound, they'll be waiting for a ring state. If they are configured for outbound, you'll have them in an idle state. The inbound and outbound fax status shows you the activity that is going on with respect to any fax calls that are coming in or any outbound faxes that are currently queued up. The fields at the top for each one of the channel statuses tells you which page it is currently receiving or sending, the baud rate of the transmission taking place, the fax number, and whether air correction mode is on or off, the line encoding method being used, the resolution of the page, and the remote fax ID. The modulation tells you the speeds, whether it's V.17, V.21, or V.34. You'll also have an action button, which you can use to abort an outgoing fax, reset a fax, or take some action on the ongoing fax system. Moving on, the next important thing is the inbound routing on the server. This page allows you to configure the routing for inbound faxes to your desktop. You'll want to create recipients for all your local users and match their extension numbers and email addresses to the to header or the diversion header so the incoming faxes can be routed to the user's desktop. If none is specified, the default global routing is used which delivers the faxes to the configured administrator. You'll also have a choice for setting the email size limit that allows you to match what has already been set for your individual users on your SMTP server. This makes sure those incoming faxes that are beyond the size limit are broken down to multiple faxes to the size that is permitted by your incoming email server. The next important difference between our analog fax server and the fax over IP server is how the software is updated and how the licenses are managed. We'll spend a few minutes on this page because this is relatively new compared to your experience with our analog fax servers. With the previous analog fax finder, we would release the firmware file, which you would select and apply to the device, and then is loaded with the new firmware flashed and rebooted. Whereas in this new version of the fax over IP server, what we intend to do is have all the latest updates available on our multitech.net website, which will be posted as new releases are made available. From the user interface, one can go and check for updates and have them applied automatically. There is also a mechanism to downgrade the unit and there is a separate app note available for this procedure. If you click on check for updates and there is no update available, you will receive a message saying the software is up to date. The other important thing to note is the license upgrade mechanism. In this screen we show how many channels are authorized to use on this hardware. It also displays a hardware ID which is unique to your specific hardware. You should remember to note down this ID someplace because this is required for you when you contact our technical support, whether for support or for buying new licenses. It is also displays the current license key. So now I would like to talk a little bit more on how to get the new licensing key using our web interface. When you get a new license key, you need to plug it into the license key field and then click on the upgrade license button for it to apply the license. 
when the license gets applied, you can go and check on your home page to find what your FactsFinder model number has changed to FF240-IP and the number of channels you are now authorized to use. Next, I want to briefly talk about the service license management and how you can buy new licenses. Typically, your box will come with a two-port license, which is the default, and if you want to buy additional licenses, you'll need to purchase a license upgrade kit from your reseller or distributor. With the license upgrade kit, there's an upgrade code and you'll need to go to multitech.com slash activate slash ffip.go and the URL would allow you to enter your hardware ID and your upgrade code and submit it for Multitech to process it. Once the Multitech system processes it, you should get an email back with your new license key. Now you can take the new license key and apply that from your software for you to activate the additional licenses. This is all done through our web-based GUI interface. I would like to mention that the license management is a new thing we are doing with our Facts Over IP product line. Hopefully, this will allow you an easier upgrade path for new licenses. I would now like to briefly talk about the changes that have been done with the client software. One of the primary goals in designing the client software has been to make it relatively change-free. Our idea was not to make any changes to the client whatsoever and to be independent of the fax over IP hardware. The only change has been to detect the new fax over IP hardware, so when you get into your client software and search for new servers, it can now detect the FF240-IP hardware and list it as one of the fax finders that can be used. Once you set up the fax finder client software, you can queue your faxes exactly the same way as you have been doing with your analog fax finder. The software versions has been upgraded to 2.2.x and is what will be shipped with our fax over IP hardware. The client version is also compatible with our current analog fax finders so that there is no real reason to worry about backwards compatibility with the current analog fax finder hardware that is being shipped now. The next few slides are typical application diagrams that show how the fax over IP box can be configured with the different PBX vendors, primarily the Shortel and the Avaya SES server. This particular screen shows a typical diagram of how you can configure an FF240 IP with the Shortel switches. The two applications that you can do with the Shortel is one single number for both voice and fax, in which case you would need to configure your Shortel switch to use the fax server feature that they have internally available and select the redirect mechanism for redirecting all the fax calls to the fax over IP server. In this mechanism, the Shortel switch will be able to detect the incoming call as either a voice or fax, and if it is a fax call, it is going to redirect the call to the fax over IP server for receiving and then routing it to the desktop. There is another application where you can have a unique voice extension and a unique fax extension, in which case there is no need for you to use the fax server feature on the Shortel switch, but you should be able to configure it as a regular extension. For both of these applications, there is a separate app note available on Multitech's website which provides you with complete details on how to configure the Shortel switches as well as the fax finder hardware. The next application is the Avaya SES server integration with the fax over IP server. For this, we do have our own app notes available for you on how to configure the Avaya SES and the fax over IP system. What you would want to do is configure SIP trunks rather than trying to do this as a SIP endpoint and do the registration. A SIP trunk is much easier way of configuring that would allow you to forward any incoming SIP calls into your Avaya system to the fax over IP device. Likewise, for the fax over IP system to forward the SIP calls to the Avaya system. The steps are similar. You create a SIP trunk on the SES server and configure the FF240-IP as a trusted host on the Avaya server. Now you can go ahead and create a routing rule on your S8300 server to transfer all fax calls to the SIP trunks. And similarly, you configure your fax over IP device to forward all outgoing calls on the SIP trunk to your SES server. This essentially covers today's presentation of the fax over IP installation and the uses of the different IP PBX systems. For more information, we encourage you to check out our website and read all the app notes and read through the manual for more information. 
You can always reach us on our online support portal if further assistance is needed at www.multitech.com support. Thank you.